I do stand before you, as was noted here, uh, really uh, having achieved greatness. I mean, I'm not just an overrated general, I am the greatest, the world's most overrated. <laughs> and this did no small part. I will tell you, uh, I, I owe New York. I owe New York for this because Senator Schumer, have I thank you uh, for bringing my name up in a rather contentious meeting in Washington <laughs> where this grew out of. Um, so I would just tell you too that I'm honored to be considered that by, by Donald Trump because he also called Meryl Streep an overrated actress. <laughs> so I guess I'm the Meryl Streep of generals. <laughs> and, and frankly, that sounds pretty good to me. Uh, and you do have to admit uh, that between me and Merrill, at least we've had some victories. <clears throat> and some of you were kind during the reception and asked me, you know, uh, if this bothered me to have been rated this way uh, based on what Donald Trump said. I said, of course not. I'd earned my spurs on the battlefield, Martin, as you pointed out, and Donald Trump earned his spurs in a letter from a doctor. So. <laughs> Not in the least bit put out by it. And I think the only person in the military that Mr. Trump doesn't think is overrated is who you pointed out, Martin, and that's Colonel Sanders. <laughs> uh, but none of this can diminish the honor that I feel tonight of being here among all of you wonderful folks in this great all-American city. I too, Mary Ann, was thinking of my parents as I was coming in tonight. Uh, they were married just a couple blocks away in 1946 in a small chapel in St. Patrick's Cathedral. And I have no doubt, uh, believe me, ladies and gentlemen, no doubt that they would be surprised as I was when I received uh, the Cardinal's phone call to come here and speak at this august event. If you told my parents 46 years ago, considering they would have been entitled to drown me at birth had they known how many gray hairs I was going to give them, if you had told them that I was going to be speaking to a room full of clergy, including the Cardinal, their first question would have been, so what did he do? <laughs> Followed shortly by, 10 Hail Marys are not sufficient, throw the book at him. <laughs> but I grew up out in the West, they moved West, and we don't get dressed up like this out there very often. Uh, to be honest with you, the last time I wore this outfit was for a public cremation. <laughs> True story. And I assured Mary when I sat down next to her that I had had the suit cleaned <laughs> since that time. Uh, I'm used to wearing a uniform, as many of you know. Uh, I was served in the U.S. Marines. I'm very proud of that service. I commanded forces. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I commanded forces, as Martin pointed out, in Iraq, in Syria, in Afghanistan. I tried to bring some peace and order to places with no organized government, chaotic and warring factions, irrational fears and toxic hatred. It was hard work, but it wasn't until I started working in Washington, D.C. that I realized how easy I had it overseas in a combat zone. <laughs> now, this won't be news to anyone in this room, but we're going through a tough, highly partisan time here in our country. And I've never been much for partisanship. I've always believed in bipartisanship, and the greatness of our country lies in teamwork. And my record on bipartisanship is clear. After all, I've reportedly been fired by presidents of both parties. <laughs> I will stand on that record. <clears throat> As many of you know, Donald Trump nicknamed me Mad Dog. But these days, I've turned over a kinder, gentler leaf. And I like to think of myself as less of a mad dog and more of an emotional support animal. <laughs> and that's really great, because now the airlines let me fly for free. But Cardinal Dolan, I am grateful you invited me here. Uh, frankly, uh, your eminence, uh, after some of my public remarks, I don't get invited to speak in front of polite company anymore. <laughs> so my, I think my presence here is probably proof uh, of the Cardinal's generosity of spirit and the boundless forgiveness of God that I could be here with you tonight. It's been a year since I left the administration. Uh, the recovery process is going well, the counselor says. <laughs> I'll graduate soon. Uh, a year is, according to White House time, about 9,000 hours of executive time or 1,800 holes of golf. 
and that's given me some time to reflect and to think about what our country and where it, about our country and where it's going. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. I wanted to reflect on the legacy of Al Smith, showing affection to the children as they are helped into adulthood and what remains the greatest country, most promising country, most wonderful country on earth and our responsibility to that generation. As I studied Al Smith, I had to look him up and learn more about him. I found what we find in many great leaders, Abe Lincoln, FDR, it's a focus on making our country a little better when we hand it to the next generation and having a nonpartisan approach to team building. Your eminence, when we spoke on the phone, you noted that we meet in the spirit here tonight of unity and friendship, patriotism. And so I turn to history, for we've been through tough times in the past in our country, and often in history, I have found the way forward. It's tempting this evening to look back exactly a century to 1919, the year that Alfred Emanuel Smith first took office as governor of New York. His nomination as the Democratic Pre Party's candidate for president, the first Roman Catholic to be nominated for that office by a major party still lay nine years ahead. It was in many ways a troubled time. Anti-immigrant fervor ran high, political corruption made national headlines. The glitz of the jazz, jazz age was real, yet working and living conditions for much of the American population were abysmal. The country was enjoying an economic boom, but a storm was on the horizon. So there's a certain resonance here with today. Tonight, I'd like to recede even further into history to 1838 into Springfield, Illinois. There, an organization in Springfield called the Young Men's Lyceum, which Abraham Lincoln's friend, William Herndon, once described as a society which contained and commanded all the culture of that place. Sort of like this gathering here this evening, except it didn't have the ladies who were the better half. That month was January, and Lincoln himself was just shy of 29. Violence by supporters of slavery had shattered the state and the nation. Now at the Young Men's Lyceum, Lincoln rose to give an address called the Perpetuation of Our Political Institutions. Not the catchiest of titles, but it defined the very thing that was under threat. It's a long speech, by my reckoning, enough for 12 Al Smith dinners, and there weren't any jokes. But the core of its message can be simply stated. After extolling the wisdom of the founders and of our constitutional system, Lincoln observed great nations crumble for one of two reasons. The first is aggression from the outside, a prospect Lincoln declared that in America's case was inconceivable. As he put it with a flourish of memorable cadences, all the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined with all the treasure of the earth in their military chest, with a Bonaparte for a commander, could not by force take a drink from the Ohio River or make a track over the Blue Ridge Mountains in a trial of a thousand years. No, Lincoln went on, it was not the foreign aggressor we must fear. It was corrosion from within, the rot, the viciousness, the lassitude, the ignorance. Anarchy is one potential consequence of all this. Another is the rise of an ambitious leader, unfettered by conscience or precedent or decency, who would make himself supreme. <clears throat> if destruction be our lot, Lincoln warned, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. I think often of Abraham Lincoln's Lyceum speech because it embodies both our greatest hopes and our darkest fears. Today, in our own time, we need only look around us. For decades, our political conduct has been woeful and a source of national paralysis. We have supplanted trust and empathy with suspicion and contempt. We have scorched our opponents with language that precludes compromise we have brushed aside the possibility that the person with whom we disagree might actually sometimes be right. We proclaim what divides us and seldom even acknowledge what unites us. Meanwhile, the roster of urgent national issues have continued to grow, unaddressed and given the paralysis impossible to address, and all of this was approaching a level of crisis even before the specter of impeachment arose. This is the moment for an act of remembrance, 
remembrance of the core principles we used to know and live by and that we now seem to have forgotten. We seem to have forgotten that America is not some finished work, nor is it a failed project. Rather, it's an ongoing experiment for which all of us bear responsibility, including a responsibility to repair. We seem to have forgotten that the foundational virtue of democracy is trust, not trust in one's own rectitude or opinion, but trust in the capacity of collective deliberation to move us forward. We seem to have forgotten that cynicism, which has now infected the Western democracies, is not realism for all the weary and knowing heirs it affects. Cynicism is just cowardice. It is nothing less than a form of surrender. And finally, we seem to have forgotten, too, the paramount importance of those bonds of affection that Lincoln once spoke of. We need one another more than ever when the chips are down. Historically, we have come together in those moments after the attack on Pearl Harbor, after the 9-11 attack on this very city. The surest path to catastrophe is to ignore our better angels and sever those bonds of affection. As you know, it was my privilege over a period of four decades to wear the uniform of the Marines, and I can tell you it's a much more comfortable uniform than the one I'm wearing tonight. But this evening, I would like to also share two stories from my time in uniform. One is a reminder of the importance of keeping things in perspective, especially in difficult times. The other, a reminder to see ourselves sometimes as others do, because what they see sometimes doesn't show up in our own mirrors. The first story comes from April of 2004 in Iraq, outside a city where insurgents had taken control. My forces were poised to take it back. The night before the assault, probably around 1 o'clock in the morning, I had spoken to the assault troops as they prepared for battle, and it was now time for generals to get out of the way and leave it to the young men. Afterwards, when one Marine thought I was out of earshot, I heard him ask his squad leader, do you think it's going to be tough? And the squad leader replied in a corporal's vernacular that I won't quote verbatim, but he said, hush and get some rest. We took Iwo Jima. Fallujah won't be nothing. I think of those words as I look at the responsibilities that we Americans must shoulder now, shoulder today. We have succeeded against greater odds. We wring our hands about the condition of the country, yet we're not facing the Civil War or the Great Depression. It is hard work to make our democracy work, and indeed, our Constitution was designed to make it hard. But hard it might be, it is also noble work, for we're building a country here. And my second story also comes from Iraq. One day, we apprehended an insurgent in the act of planting a mine on a major road. In fact, it was a road I'd just driven on. Now a prisoner, bound hand and foot, the Marines brought him to me, because they were surprised to find that he spoke English. He and I talked for a bit, and I made clear he was lucky to be alive and that he had an orange jumpsuit in his future. He was, no two ways about it, the enemy, at least when he was doing his day job or his night job. America, in his mind, was the great Satan. But before he was loaded onto a trick truck to be taken off to confinement, he said, General, can I ask you something? And so I stopped and waited for him. He said, if I behave myself, if I'm a model prisoner, is there a chance that my family and I can immigrate to America? <laughs> now think about that. I wasn't going to sponsor him, but his words offered a reminder to me. <laughs> his words reminded me how America is still viewed in the, in, in the world. Even among those who profess to hate it, America remains a power of inspiration in their lives as well. They see our freedoms and our vitality, our long tradition of democratic government, our chaotic and exuberant culture, and they want in. I often wish that we Americans could see ourselves through foreign eyes. He would remind us of our great good fortune and of the good things that we have in common, the good things we too often take for granted would remind us, too, of the precious deposit of freedom and the faith in our founding principles that have been passed up to now from generation to generation. <clears throat> that is what the 29-year-old Abraham Lincoln wanted to remind his own audience at the Young Men's Lyceum. 
and he called on his listeners to renew their commitment. He said, let every American, every lover of liberty, every well-wisher to his prosperity, swear by the blood of the revolution, never to violate in the least particular the laws of the country, and never to tolerate their violation by others. In 1782, in Alexander Hamilton's last letter to his comrade in arms, Lieutenant Colonel John Lawrence, he wrote, we have fought side by side to make America free. Let us hand in hand struggle to make her happy. Now, Lawrence died in one of the last skirmishes of our long, seemingly endless war for independence, never seeing the happy country for which he gave his life. We owe him a debt as we owe a debt to all who have fought for liberty, including those who tonight serve in the far corners of our planet, among them the American men and women supporting our Kurdish allies. The phrase... <laughs> and I would note that the phrase, all who have fought for liberty, also includes the generations of ordinary citizens who have embodied our national ideals and passed them down. In Springfield, Lincoln invoked biblical language to describe how the power of this common spirit protects our nation. He said, as truly as has been said of the only greater institution, your eminence, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So ladies and gentlemen, with malice for none and charity for all, let us restore trust in one another. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.